This is Michelle McKenzie, and welcome to the WTF Podcast, where we demystify entrepreneurship and the fog around funding. Are you a social entrepreneur looking to connect your purpose-driven organization to corporate revenue and resources? Keep listening. In this episode, my guests will share strategies that will position your organization to generate funding and resources from corporations and larger organizations. Lori Zoss Kraska is Growth Owl's founder and chief principal. She possesses over 22 years of expertise in revenue generation management, corporate sponsorship support, corporate cause marketing, fundraising, corporate social responsibility, nonprofit consulting, executive sales management training, and marketing strategy roles, earning her a reputation for establishing pathways quickly to exceeding revenue fund slash fundraising goals, building high performance teams, developing relationships quickly, and outpacing expectations. In this episode, we'll discuss strategies for helping businesses and social entrepreneurs successfully engage with corporate funders to raise funds to support their business and nonprofit goals. Before we dive into the episode, Are you struggling to connect with your audience? If so, you may have a messaging problem. The PR University can help you fix that. If content is king, strategic positioning is queen. Getting your messaging to your desired audience is key. If you are an entrepreneur, author, speaker, subject matter expert, influencer, or business leader, the PR University might be right for you. Visit the PRUniversity.com to learn more and enter the code WTF25 to get 25% off. Lori, welcome to the WTF podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I am excited to have you. That intro was a mouthful. In terms of the support that you provide for social and business entrepreneurs to help them connect to corporate funding. Yes. Let's start at the beginning. Tell me about your background helping organizations attract corporate funding. Yeah. So I started Growth Owl LLC back in 2018 with the intention of specifically helping purpose-driven organizations, which I would consider nonprofits, associations, startups, social entrepreneurs, helping them get in front and connect to the right types of people, specifically in Fortune 1000, Fortune 500 space, and present themselves, connect in a way that's going to resonate with those decision makers in order to be successful, to get through the myriads of different steps in terms of dealing with those types of companies, because it can be complicated. Throughout my career, I've worked with corporations, but I spent a good 10 years with PBS and NPR working with local stations and a team of folks to help bring corporate sponsorship to our stations. And that's why I really kind of honed my craft. And I thought to myself, wow, I think there's something here to go beyond just public media and to help others connect with the resources and the funding that they need for these great organizations that they represent, as well as their ideas. You started out in public radio, which is a corporation looking to bring in corporate funding. Yeah. How does that now translate down to start nonprofit or startup business? What is the right mindset that business and nonprofit leaders should have to attract corporate funding? So I would like to say a great way to help you stand apart, no matter if you're a large multi-million dollar nonprofit or you're a startup with just a couple thousand dollars in the bank, the principles really are the same. And you said it first, you have to have a positive mindset. You are going to get a lot of no's before you get that big yes. And I've been doing this for over 22 years and I still get no's. That's just a part of how this happens. And you have to understand that although your idea makes 100% sense to you, the challenge is how do you make it resonate and connect with others that have the resources you're looking for? 
So the best way to do that in keeping that positive mindset, I like to call it um, having good corporate empathy, really understanding that these corporate decision makers, they literally have thousands of things on their to-do list. And going in and understanding that you're just one part of those thousands of things, first of all, that's going to stand you apart. And also having the confidence to really embrace the power of brevity. This is probably the area that I coach my clients on the most. I think where people falter a little bit when they're first engaging and even in those first proposals or pitch meetings, they're just saying too much, which makes sense, right? You're excited. You want to get everything out there because your mentality is, this is my one and only chance, right? I'm challenging you to think, no, this isn't your one and only chance. This is your first step in a journey with this corporation to get you what you need. So you need to change the mindset and really focus on what is the connection between what you're doing and what you've researched about this corporation and what they've supported. Corporate decision makers really like brevity. They have thousands of other things to do. So if you can encapsulate what you're doing, why it's important, and why it should resonate with that company, that's the perfect first start to get you started. I agree with that, especially the part about brevity. I have a background in grant making. I worked yeah. for a grant making organization for about 10 years, and I always tell people, keep it brief. Yes. Keep it brief. Sometimes they overwhelm you with so much information, it's hard for the reader to determine what's important, and then I need back to the mission of the organization itself. What does that organization want to achieve? And how does what you're doing help the organization achieve their mission? So often when applications come in, it's about the need of that organization or that founder. They're telling you what they need, but oftentimes not addressing the need of the funder, the person on the other side. How does this project, this proposal, this business, whatever it is that you're working on, how does it help that organization meet their need or pursue or forward their mission? So I love that. Another thing, I was recently interviewing another guest, and this was more on the business startup side. And yeah. he said the moment when he realized something was off with his fundraising strategy, that he was fundraising incorrectly. Because he was making the assumption that because something is important to him, it's right. important to everyone else that right. he's speaking to about that thing. And it goes back to what I was saying, not connecting what you are proposing or pitching to the person on the other side of the table, to their goals, their interests, their mission, and do that in a succinct and brief way. Absolutely. You said that beautifully, by the way. And... The, the other reason you want to do that is there's a ton of competition for this money. I know that sometimes social entrepreneurs and nonprofit executives don't like to talk about competition, but it's real. You are competing for this money. So you have to find a way to diversify yourself quickly. And doing that through brevity and clear communication, as you've outlined, is really the way to do it. We live in a society of 15-second pre-roll messages half second dings on our phone notifications. We've been trained now to want brief communication, but there's still parts of the business world and in the nonprofit and social entrepreneurship world that really see this need to want to provide more detail when everything else in society is like, no, short, short. So short and impactful wins the game. Yeah. And right. sometimes not understanding that that first conversation is an introduction to get you to the next conversation. Exactly. It's not the whole kit and caboodle. That's so right. Make it interesting enough for them to want to come back to you to learn more. And I get it. With a grant proposal, it's this one thing. It has a deadline. You have to fit everything yeah. in there. But still, you have to make it as compelling as possible. And yes. oftentimes they have word count or, you know, space like you can't go beyond this number of characters. Yeah. So get the best bang for your buck within the space allowable that you have. That's Make right. Sure that you can get into the right information. Yes. Now, I heard from one of my listeners. Yeah. And she started a nonprofit. And she has some questions, like many nonprofit leaders who are also startups, right? If it's early. Yeah. 
how to get funding in the midst of this economy. And I guess lots of people who have businesses, whether you're a business or a social entrepreneur, that's a question that's on everyone's mind. What's your response to that? Here's what I think is so interesting. And and I want to preface this by saying I'm not downplaying that, of course, there, there could there be a recession? Are we paying more for a dozen of eggs? You know, I'm not downplaying nope, any of nope. that. Okay, But here's what I'm seeing. I am seeing that more corporate foundations are hiring a lot of people. And again, I'm working with Fortune 100s, you know, and I talk to these people every day and they are growing those areas of their business. Why? Because it resonates with people. So looking at just the hiring and and the number of people being hired in corporate foundations, corporate social responsibility, DEI, accessibility, that gives me hope that even though we do see layoffs, especially like what's going on with tech and cutbacks, we're still seeing hiring going on in the areas that would resonate most with a nonprofit, which is in philanthropic and in corporate social responsibility, right? So that's one thing to think about. Also, even if you go back to the Great Depression, if you go back in history, there are still organizations providing philanthropic support, even in the worst of times. That will never go away because we're human beings and we want to help. Now, will there be more competition? Absolutely. There's probably going to be more nonprofits asking for funding from corporations now more than ever, which is why going back to our conversation earlier about really having positive mindset, brevity, what have you, those tools will help you as you're starting up. I guess the real question that people want to ask is, well, how do I connect with those opportunities for corporate fundraising, right? Because sometimes people make it seem like, well, the reason why I'm not connecting is because of whatever is going on in the macroeconomic environment. When in reality, maybe I don't know what the right steps, what the right processes, what the right strategies are for connecting. So let's talk about that, Lori. Sure. My biggest suggestion is to get on LinkedIn. I am a huge fan of LinkedIn. I will tell you that a good 80% of my engagement now in working with corporate decision makers that I've not approached yet in the past, so I'm starting a new relationship, I'm starting it on LinkedIn. And think about the technology we have now. You, You technically can just search the name of XYZ Corporation's corporate philanthropy officer or director of new initiatives who works with social entrepreneurs and find their name. I mean, 15, 20 years ago, that took a little more work, right? (laughs) So take advantage of LinkedIn and reach out to people. Keep the message brief, just introduce who you are and talk about what is it that you see in that corporation's habits or mission, vision, and values that relates to what you're doing. And then end the message with, you know, would love a brief 15 minute Zoom or conversation. Or if you happen to be geographically in the same area, maybe you could meet up for coffee. But I'm, I'm a big fan of starting there and don't be afraid to start high up. You know, I start with the senior vice president or higher because what's great is a lot of times as a smaller nonprofit, you might get a referral to somebody else in the company from that senior vice president. So that other person will talk to you because they've been referred, right? Hey, Joe Smith referred me to you or, or Joe Smith will make the introduction. Just because Joe, Joe Smith doesn't have the time doesn't mean he doesn't care and see the value. So we'll send you to somebody else. So I see a lot of that activity happening more on LinkedIn. And what also I loved about LinkedIn is that it's done a really good job at staying as kind of a professional atmosphere. And uh, I think as as long as we stay within that, you know, we're going to be in good shape in terms of making connections. So that would be definitely my my first um, suggestion in terms of connecting. And then my second is use your board of directors or your board of advisors. Ask them whom they could make connections to. Now, a lot of times I know there are some board members or advisors that don't feel comfortable asking for donations. That's fine, but they should be engaging to make connections for you. 
or to say, hey, here's an email address of Joan Smith, who I know is really interested in our cause. Can you can you contact? Those would be my two recommendations, utilizing LinkedIn and utilizing your board of directors and advisors to make referrals for you. What if you don't have a very good board that is good at helping you to fundraise? And maybe that's your thing right there. You might need to reconstitute your board to get people who can help you fundraise. Yeah, it's a good question. I actually do a lot of board training where I'm brought in on this situation. but. Even if you don't even have an advisory board yet, because that's even possible, right? You have mentors. You have people that you've trust. You have people that you've spoken with that helped you help to get you where you are. You know, I can even give you my, my journey into entrepreneurship. I spent a good year talking to different entrepreneurs and getting their feedback as to how they did it. How did they bridge out of their traditional work to start their LLC or to start their nonprofit. And I got to tell you, I was amazed at how helpful they were and how much they wanted to help me. So again, keeping that positive mindset, don't be afraid to ask for help and to ask for referrals. So if it's not your board, go to your friend circle. And also business luncheons, chamber luncheons, network yourself a bit. And that will start to build a network for you because you can't You can't really do it alone. We're people, we're a community. So you will need to ask for help at some point. And that doesn't mean you have to put it under the guise of a formal board of directors and advisors. Now that they have the right mindset, what's the next step? You alluded to that when we talked about LinkedIn. So do your research. Yes. Find out what are the corporate corporations out there that are aligned with the type of work that you do. Let's yeah. say, for instance, you are a nonprofit working in the mental health space. Yeah. What are the steps that you should take to then go out and find out, well, what corporations are interested in this that I might be able to, to pitch what I'm doing to? How are the best ways to find that out? What's your strategy for, for getting to the heart of who can I actually approach with this? Great question. So let's start with activity goals first, because I think the biggest thing, the biggest problem that people run into, they'll make a list of like 40 or 50. And then it just becomes overwhelming. So when I work with clients of all sizes, it doesn't matter what size you are. This is the same advice. Start with small achievable goals. A great goal would be instead of putting together a list of 50, let's just pick two or three a week that you are going to research. And when I say research, you're going to look at their website. You're going to look at their reports to the community. You know, what are they doing in the areas of philanthropy and corporate social responsibility? And you're going to research a little about the decision maker. Go on their LinkedIn. What's interesting about LinkedIn now, I'm finding that people are revealing more about themselves in terms of their interests. So they'll even come out and say, I'm personally interested in human rights and mental health in the environment. So all of that research is essential. And then once you've done that research, create your plan to reach out via email or by phone. But start small with very small achievable goals, like to do that two or three times a week. I wanted to reference that first because I think that's really important. So you don't feel overwhelmed because I think most people that do this have a lot of other things going on and they have to fit it in to their day, right? Outside of that research process is really important and you can even take it a step higher and set up Google alerts. So I'm a big fan of Google alerts. If you've never done it, it's really simple. Just Google, Google alert, (laughs) and it will walk you through how you could set up a topic like mental health in Atlanta, Georgia. And Google will start to email you articles and relevant information about mental health in Atlanta, Georgia. And most likely you're going to see some corporations or potential prospects come through that are supporting mental health initiatives in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, when I tell people to do this, another recommendation is maybe set up another email address for this because you will get a lot of information to siphon through. But the more specific you can get, the better. But that's been a great way to find prospects. If you have absolutely no clue where to start, 
setting up Google Alerts is definitely a great place to start. I'm speaking with Laurie Zoss Kraska about helping entrepreneurs engage with corporate funders. In this next segment, we'll discuss five things that business and nonprofit leaders need to know or understand about the nuances of corporate support before pursuing corporate funding. Lori, that was great advice. What are five things that business and nonprofit leaders need to know or understand about the nuances of corporate support landscapes and its decision makers before pursuing corporate funding? All right, so you want five. So we're going to review a few that we've already touched on because they are important. So number one, realize that these decision makers have thousands of other things going on. And you mentioned this earlier, which is a great point. You know, what might be priority number one for you as the social entrepreneur or nonprofit executive is priority number 3,500 for the decision maker. So if communication comes back to you, again, a bit brief or a little abrupt, don't take it personally. Number two, I want to highlight again that power of brevity. Really, if you're kind of feeling frustrated because you've sent out emails upon emails and are getting no responses, I would challenge you to go back in those emails and count how many words they are. How long does it take you to scroll through the email? I have a best practice of trying to keep your initial engagement email to a corporation to 150 words or less. Using that recipe, that really forces you to think about what I had mentioned before, right? So if, if I'm thinking about that email in that 150 words, I want to introduce who I am and who my organization is. Number two, what is the connection between what I'm doing in my organization with what the corporation has done that you think is the fit? And number three, what do you want next? Do you want a phone call? Do you want another follow-up email? Do you want to have coffee? Bam, bam, bam. That brevity in an email, again, is, is really going to set you apart. Also, understanding that and not getting and staying in a positive mindset that if you feel as though you're doing a good job explaining your purpose and your relevance, but feeling frustrated because the other party that's listening to you just isn't getting it. That falls back on you. It just means that you need to find another way to connect with this person. We all receive communication in very different ways, right? We receive and process information very differently. You've got to be able to adapt to different people's personalities. So if that's something you struggle with, or just feeling frustrated about that's probably a good time to bring in maybe a, a trusted friend or a mentor to listen to how you're presenting and maybe they can give you feedback or there's consultants like you, like me that <laughs> are out there that can, can help you as well. So I think that's very important as well. So I think amongst all of that, we might've hit five. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the key things I heard is Twitterize your communication. I love the brevity that. piece. Yeah. Tutorize it. I love it. You don't have too much time to wade through a lot of information. Yeah. And another strategy that they might consider is what you did when you were considering pursuing entrepreneurship. Go around and speak to other nonprofits that are in your sector. Yeah. You know, maybe sit on mental health and have conversations with them. Ask them about their fundraising journey or just growing their organization and see if they're willing to share. Like you found people are much more willing to share than you would have thought. So that yeah. might be a strategy that others in a similar position, whether you're running a business or running a profit, talk to your peers. Exactly. Yeah. I was really amazed at how many people wanted to really help me once I was really open about what I was looking to do. I think that's an important piece. Start talking to people. They say closed mouths don't get fed. So that's open up right. Oh, I like that. <laughs> We're having conversations to see who's willing to help you because you might be surprised. How should they prepare a proposal that sets them apart? Let's say you've got the mindset piece. You're staying positive. You've done your research. You've looked on LinkedIn. You've made some connections. You've talked to your peers about where they have sought out funding from. Now you're getting ready to approach them. How do you approach them in the most impactful way? I love this question. 
because I have something regarding proposals that I call pumpkin spice proposals and how to stay away from them. So the whole idea of pumpkin spice proposals kind of goes back to brevity. You're putting in a bunch of spice that you don't need. You just need the coffee, right? (laughs) So what are some examples of pumpkin spice that are not needed? By the way, I love pumpkin spice latte. Don't get me wrong. As a drink, I love it. But as a way of describing proposals that I think you need to kind of curb, I call them pumpkin spice proposals. You just need the coffee. So some pumpkin spice that you could take out so it's more effective. First of all, visually, take a look at your proposal. Do you have, you don't need the logo a lot. Once is fine. But if you want to put in an image to represent something that is important to your project, that's fine. But images should not take over the entire proposal. So now it's like 10 pages and half of it is just stock image, right? Also kind of creating an outline that is going to get their attention. Very similar to how I talked about your email. So with proposals, it's the same thing. First of all, tell us a little about your organization. Second, how does your organization connect to the organization, the corporation that you're proposing? Talk a little about the project, unless this is general operating funding. But if there's a specific project, obviously talk about the project. And then talk about the impacts it could have. And then end it with a message of gratitude. And I like to call this a message of gratitude because every proposal that I usually see says, thank you. This is where I want to see more information. I want to see a specific message of gratitude that says something like, we realize that XYZ Corporation talks to nonprofits every day. And there's, there's a lot of competition out there to get partnership or resource support. So we just wanted to take this time to thank you for your time and consideration in looking over this very important work. Yeah, or even using that opportunity to then make sure you're tying it back into the mission. Thank you for taking the time to review this application and this groundbreaking work that we're doing in XYZ space that is very well aligned with your mission. Remind them how mission aligned this thing is with what we are doing. Perfect. I love that. You're leaving them with. I love that. I've even had decision makers say things like, Why do I get proposals that the font type is so small? People tend to go to a a smaller font so it can be fewer pages. Well, if you've got, you know, glasses, you don't want to put somebody in a bad frame of mind when they're trying to read your proposal. This eight point font, I could barely read this, you know? So I always tell, I tell folks from font size, I like to do an 11 or 12 point font, Times New Roman, Arial, nothing crazy. Um, and just make sure you can visually read it. That's really important. I get a lot of feedback from corporate decision makers about how it looks from a font perspective and watch the copy and paste. I realize you have a lot of boilerplate stuff, but you got to watch that and companies realize that the more you can tailor and specify it to what they're doing, the better it's going to be. Just focus on the coffee, not the pumpkin spice for the proposal. Yeah, I say don't do anything that's going to put your reviewer in a bad mood yet because they are reading a lot of proposals. Yes. Yours is the only one. Yes. And you want to make sure that what you are saying resonates. It's impactful. It connects back to their mission. You want them to be doing this when they're reading it. That's right. Lots of smiles. Well, the listeners won't be able to see what I'm yeah. doing, but like shaking their head and going, yeah, yes, okay, this person gets it. They get it. All right. Yes. This looks great. Yes. You want them to feel as if they're just, oh my gosh, another one. Okay. (laughs) More information that I don't need. Okay. This font. Oh, I need to get. So all of those things, it might seem petty or trivial, but it matters when the person on the other side has to wade through lots of proposals or applications. Absolutely. Lori, as we're getting ready to wrap up. Yeah. Where can... Business and nonprofit leaders find resources that will help them fundraise? It's a great question. So I got to tell you, probably some of your best resources are looking at what other nonprofits or other social entrepreneurs are actually successfully been able to generate. Most nonprofits will place on their websites and as well as in their reports to the community who's funding them. Look at those. I think that's your most qualified place to look. 
I have a great story about this. When I was still working in public media, my office was actually in the theater district and we worked in this great old historical building and the large theater foundation that was also in the building posted a huge wall full of all of their donors and corporate philanthropic supporters. And I thought to myself, wow, this is a great prospect list. <laughs> you know, it's just out there, right? So you never know where you can find ideas. And uh, yeah, for any of you in the arts community, look at the playbills when you, when you go to an event or a performance and look around at the actual theater hall that you're in. Most likely, look at the names that are sponsoring things. It, it's all there. And what's great about that is those are people and organizations that have a proven history that you can reference doing some of the things that you're doing. But again, I really like the annual reports and uh, reports to the community of other nonprofits. And then on the other side of it, corporations will report on the nonprofits and social entrepreneurs that they support. And you can usually find that again in their own annual reports and as well as, well as check their ESG reports as well and CSR reports. That's great advice. Laurie, before you leave, tell the listeners where they can learn about what you do and where to find you on socials. Yeah. So my website is thegrowthowl.com. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Just type in my name, Lori Zoskraska, or my company, Growth Owl LLC. You can also find me on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel. Just type in Growth Owl LLC. And you can learn more about my book, The Boardroom Playbook, on Amazon. Just type in The Boardroom Playbook. Great, right, great. Lori, send me a link to it on Amazon and I'll drop it in the show notes so that Excellent. the listeners can access it easily. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was great. I hope that the listeners get a lot of value from what I find to be a very valuable conversation. Thank you so much for stopping by, Lori. Thank you. It's my pleasure. To my listeners, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Don't keep good content to yourself. If you enjoyed this episode, Leave a rating and a review and share this episode with three friends. Subscribe to the podcast at its home on the Alive Podcast Network or on the Alive Podcast app. The podcast also streams on some of your favorite podcast streaming platforms. Follow the podcast on its Instagram page at where's the funding underscore podcast and on its LinkedIn page. And don't forget to follow me. Michelle J. McKenzie on LinkedIn. New episodes stream on Fridays. Join me next Friday for the next episode.